All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Liz Buckle. I'm director of product here at Commonwealth and welcome to our Commonwealth 101 session where we will build some foundational knowledge together about what Commonwealth is, um, why we came to be and what we're up to today. So with that, I will go ahead and get us started. Um, if I can. So Commonwealth, um, we are a not-for-profit trade association, and we have sort of two core aspects to our vision. And this has been consistent really since day one, since the Alliance was formed. So we believe that health data should be available to individuals and their providers, regardless of where they've had care in the past. Um, I always like to talk about myself a little bit in, in this section of the vision. Um, I have lived in seven different states. I've received care, you know, across most of the eastern part of the United States, at least, um, you know, from the northeast all the way down to Georgia. And so I've had care. I've had children. I've had important diagnoses take place. Um, and so this piece of the vision really um, is is critical um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the slides. And the second component is that a provider's ability to access this data has to be built into their workflow, has to be easy for them to use at a reasonable cost. We want to also make sure that it's available, you know, to a broad range of healthcare providers and to the people they serve um, across the United States. Going straight from that into our mission. Um, so we were founded and continue to be a vendor neutral platform. Um, our goal consistently is that we want to make sure that we're breaking down both technological and process barriers um, that, you know, challenge um, effective data exchange. We leverage existing standards. Um, we, you know, if you look at some of our comments and the work that we've done in the past, um, we like to point to standards that are in place through SDO, standard development organizations that go through formal balloting processes. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to point to things that work and we want to help those things work at a, a, a large scale. And so that's what we've done over the course of the past 11 years. Um, a little bit about us. So our team is all here on the call today. Um, our fearless leader, Paul, is our executive director. Um, and then I am director of product. So overseeing, um, you know, the product, which is the network and the services uh, within that network and how they all work together with for our members. We have Courtney on, who is a uh, lead on all things marketing and communications. And then Marina is our business ops manager manager um, and she is really the go to for anything and everything uh, under the sun as it relates to the Alliance. If she doesn't know the answer, she will find it for you. So she's a great resource um, to have. We also are supported by a technical service provider, um, which is LK. And then we also have additional contractors that work alongside of us to make this whole ship uh, go in the right direction. Alright, so before we really get started, I wanted to um, first share a, a short video with you. It's about two minutes long um, and it's our Meet Susan video. And so while I do that, I'm going to move things over here <clears throat> and the Meet Susan video is one that is um, actually I think it's about nine years old now. Um, let me make sure I did that with sound actually even though I just said, hey, make sure I do that with sound. Um, include sound. And it, even though it is almost a decade old, um, it, it just kind of goes to show that the key concepts and challenges that we intended to, um, to face a decade ago um, are still ringing true. We've made significant strides um, in with regard to uh, scalable interoperability, and we'll talk about kind of the then and now here shortly. But first, I just want to share this um, short video with you. <laughs>
So this video, what I didn't um, start out with sort of intentionally <laughs> um, is that this video has been played at every sort of Commonwealth 101 and every iteration of Commonwealth 101 um, as far back as I can remember. And I've been um, attending these since about 2017. So I imagine probably at every single one um, it's been it's been shared. And what I love about it is um you know after all of this time uh, the statements and sentiments within still hold true and are still what drives us um today and so with that i want to talk a little bit about our culture and who we are so we've talked about our mission and vision and why we're here uh what we believe in but what's sort of unique about Commonwealth is our culture and our approach to how we try to solve or at least make a little bit better um, our piece of the health IT puzzle. And so we um, we are vendor neutral. Like I said, you could see in the video so our, our founding members, um, which were mostly all competitors with each other, and they all decided to sort of uh, take off their corporate badges and come into a room together and figure out how to solve really difficult problems um, together. And it sort of set set the pace, set the standard, if you will, for what developed over the course of the past decade. And so in order to do that, we felt really strongly that core values that we wanted to have within the alliance are that of transparency. Um, we don't want to water down or make things uh, seem bigger than they are. We want to explain things as they truly are, pull back the curtain wherever and whenever possible, um, and really help to shine a light on this is what's working, this is what isn't working. Um, we really strongly value partnership and believe that our connections with all of our members are in fact partnerships because we have to work together, both members with the Alliance and members with each other um, to make this happen. Inclusiveness, um, and I, uh, an upcoming slide, I'll probably do this a lot, you know, foreshadowing, but inclusiveness and our ability to kind of stretch beyond the traditional um, types of healthcare settings um, and expand beyond those and accountability. So saying, you know, what you're going to do and doing what you say you're going to do um, to help, you know, us all move forward. And then from like a personality perspective, we are really collaborative. That's the that's the way this has been able to work um, and continues to be so. We want to be a game changer in the field. We don't want to settle for the status quo. Um, we want to continue to evolve and innovate and think about new ways, leveraging the data that we have, you know, at our fingertips, leveraging the information that we've learned, um, learning from others, and be able to continue to change the game when it comes to uh, national interoperability. We're definitely very focused, um, and our mission and vision have remained. Um, you know, the key focus areas of, of who we are and what we do, and then approachable. Um, you know, we, a lot of us here within the community who have been here for many years, think of Commonwealth and, um, you know, our key members as kind of the Commonwealth family. Um, we have competition, uh, you know, ingrained within us from, you know, corporate perspectives, but at the same time, um, we, you know, are all humans. Most of us have families. We um, share, you know, the ups and downs together, um, and that really helps us to to work together in this partnership. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the key milestones that we've hit. There's certainly a lot more to this. We actually have a whole milestones page on our website, um, but you may or may not know Commonwealth was um, first announced at HIMSS 2013, so 11 over 11 years ago now, and in less than a year, uh, the first the technology was built, the specification was written. Um, and the first providers were able to go live in less than a year, which is really remarkable. Um, for the first two years, um, 
Commonwealth was solely run by volunteers from our member organizations and the board of directors. We had no employees at all. And so in 2015, the first full time employee, uh, the first executive director was hired. Um, and at that point in time, we had, you know, over a thousand, over twelve hundred provider organizations live. Um, because we want to continue to expand, innovate, collaborate, um, we very quickly realized that we wanted to enable this network to be able to be used by consumers, by patients to query and access their own data. So we added the patient access use case and then we um, care quality was announced uh, a year or two after Commonwealth. And we realized very quickly that we needed to work in partnership um, with this framework to expand access to expand interoperability nationwide. And so we came to an agreement um, with care quality and shortly thereafter um, implemented their specification as well. Um, in 2017, I was actually working for one of our member companies and helped to participate in the production pilot uh, with Care Quality, where we start started to see some actual data exchange between Commonwealth members and Care Quality sites, um, which was really exciting. And at that point in time, we had over 8,000 provider organizations um, connected. We moved on. We added some additional use cases. We started working on fire. Um, pretty heavily, um, it, you know, moving into 2020, 2021. Um, and then in addition to that, during that time, we launched what's called our Commonwealth Connector Program. So our Commonwealth Connector Program is um, sort of like an opportunity for interoperability intermediaries to connect other health IT systems. So same type of member as, you know, an Oracle or an Athena Health, um, from a connectivity perspective, but in addition to that, um, not just connecting provider organizations or consumer applications, but able to connect like other EHR vendors, other digital health applications to help broaden um, the scope and scale of the network. Um, really proud moment in 2022, we were able to demonstrate fire at scale at HIMSS. So this is discrete fire scale using um, what is now the HL7 um, security for scalable registration auth authorization authentication uh, or more recently known as SARA. Um, we held a fire connectathon and we announced that we would um, intend to become a QHAN, a qualified health information network. And then this year, uh, we were designated as a QHIN, and we also um, launched a brand new platform um, that our legacy members are moving to and our new members are already um, going live on. And then just last month, um, we crossed the threshold into 7.7 .7 billion plus records retrieved via the network. So really significant growth and expansion over the past decade plus. And we continue to grow. Um, so this slide is cool, not just because of the stats. I mean, I just mentioned on the last 7.7 .7 billion health records retrieved via the network, which is humongous. We also have 238 million unique individuals inside of our MPI and over 36,000 provider organizations, which does not include the numbers um, of provider organizations that are available through care quality and through TEFCA. We don't even count those in our stats. Um, but what's cool about this slide is the bottom part, the little icons. Um, when we first started, the, the connections on the network were really ambulatory clinics and hospitals and health systems. Um, and that was kind of it. And now you can see, I mean, the scope is probably even more expansive than what we have, uh, you know, highlighted here on the screen. But interop intermediaries, those who are have come on board to say, hey, interop is what we do um, and we can help others um, who maybe that isn't their wheelhouse, but they have important data to share home health. Um, post acute skilled nursing labs patient access telehealth um, pharmacies you know really expanding far beyond just you know ambulatory clinics and hospitals and health systems 
So with all of that, um, we have a couple of core, really three, not a couple, a couple of core messages that we use to sort of position ourselves internally and externally. And again, you know, within this circle image here, we our goal is to break down barriers to health data exchange. We do this as a vendor neutral alliance. Um, but what does that mean? So first, we believe that we are uniquely positioned within the, um, you know, the interoperability health IT space because we have this national scope, um, you know, all 50 states, D.C., U.S. territories, Puerto Rico, et cetera. Um, we have a very diverse membership. And um, again, we're vendor neutral. So we feel like we can take interoperability. We have the platform and the resources and the experience um, to make interoperability ubiquitous. We are community building. So um, this is something that has been at the core of who we are since day one, um, bringing together different organizations, different stakeholders um, to the table to help solve problems together. Um, one of the things that, you know, really gets to me um, and can be somewhat upsetting as we if we work in this space is if the key stakeholders who are most impacted or have the most subject matter expertise are not at the table when decisions get made. And that's something that we strive very, very hard not to do. If we recognize that there's a stakeholder group that isn't um, represented, we go and have a conversation with, you know, who we can find within the industry um, and try to bring them to the table because we don't want to create um, solutions or use cases without without those people. And then um, the third thing is uh, visionary. So we continue to look to the future. Um, we have introduced new use cases over the course of the past few years, and all of those use cases either have gone through or are going through enhancements because we um, we're not afraid to try something new, and we're also not a uh, afraid to um, go back and make corrections when something doesn't work exactly as we assumed it to. Um, so we've done that with the patient access use case. We were able to see um, an increase in adoption, not to the point where that I'm personally satisfied with, but we were able to see an increase in adoption over the course of the past few years. We're doing that now with payment and healthcare operations and with patient alerts and um, trying to you know, create efficiency and make sure that what we're bringing to our members and to the network, um, you know, is is meeting people where they need to be. So this is just sort of a snapshot of the diversity in our membership. Um, so we have two different types of members uh, here at Commonwealth. We have general members who support the mission and vision of the Alliance. Um, they participate within our community. They participate um, in committees and in our fall summit, um, but they don't technically connect into the network. They may at a future time, if they have services that would make sense or have a product or solution that makes sense to connect in, um, or they you know, may just support um, the alliance. Um, and then we also have service adopters. Service adopters are the members that technically connect into the network. Um, and you can see here, there's sort of two sections of those. Um, the, the ones at the top who, that are connected and live, and then the ones below who are going through the implementation process and um, testing and bringing on board uh, their clients. Over the course of the past few years, um, this view this image has changed um, pretty significantly where we had um, far fewer on the service adopter side and far more on the general member side and now we're seeing a shift where the majority of our members are now actually service adopters um, and those that are not you know oftentimes are looking for opportunities to become service adopters So I leave this slide in, um, even though it 
sort of is no longer accurate, but I leave it in just to kind of share the stories. So the top image, you know, the where would you see this five competitors come together? This is at the um, this is at uh, the press conference, uh, you know, sort of talking about the launch of Commonwealth and these, you know, five executives staying on the stage together. Um, you can sort of see their body language. Um, you know, some of it look a little tense. Um, this is not at the time. This is not something this, you know, would, would have been 11 years ago. This is not something that you probably would have seen very frequently. Um, and then the bottom image is Epic, Cerner, Commonwealth, Care Quality, Sequoia, all standing, smiling, happy together. Um, today, we actually are seeing this more and more. And I have to I have to think that to some extent it is in part thanks to Commonwealth and the work that we've done to bring competitors together to improve interoperability at a national scale. Um, this was not normal 10, 8, seven years ago. Um, and, you know, just now, I mean, Paul and myself, we've been sitting in the room both virtually and in person um, with key competitors across health IT um, under TEFCA and, you know, figuring out, uh, figuring out opportunities to um, help TEFCA be successful. Because even though, you um, it has a strong foundation and it has, um, you know, strong uh, organizations that are now QNs. Um, it doesn't inherently mean that it's going to be successful. There's still a lot of challenges. So um, I like to think that these images and these examples um, really helped to set the lay the groundwork, lay the foundation, if you will, for um, organizations coming together for kind of interoperability for the greater good. Um, as we're starting to see it more and more today. And so um, this uh, just shows sort of that expansion over time. So, um, you know, we had, um, you know, the formation of Commonwealth on the last slide and then Commonwealth and Care Quality starting to come together. And now we have Commonwealth, Care Quality and TEFCA, all three of which Commonwealth, um, you know, obviously is is a part of um, this also helps to explain sort of how we interact uh, with these various uh, networks and frameworks. So inside of Commonwealth, and we'll talk a little bit more about this here soon. Um, we use brokered queries. We leverage a master person index and record locator service, and that means that our members that connect into us only have to maintain one connection. Um, that is, you know, between their system or systems and Commonwealth. Um, and then we broker on their behalf um, so that they don't have to maintain connections with, you know, tens or even hundreds of other endpoints. And then with care quality, um, because it's a it's a framework and there's no centralized um, infrastructure and network, um, we, uh, you know, as the Commonwealth broker in the middle, um, we do targeted queries to care quality sites um, based on a number of factors that I can talk about and here in a bit. And then sort of similarly, but not exactly the same with TEFCA, um, we broker uh, on behalf of our members QHIN to QHIN um, query. So Commonwealth is a QHIN to the other QHINs, um, and then they pass those uh, down the line. So this is the fun part. This is where I start to get into um, a bit more about our core services. Um, our core services, the way that I like to frame them is we really have three core services, um, the master person index, the record locator service, and the data broker. And those are sort of all wrapped within the trust network or trust framework um, that we have. None of these other three would be possible um, without the, the trust layer that we place on top of uh, the services. So we'll sort of dig into um, all of these three things. First, the MPI. So um, the master person index, you know, we're kind of doing a bit of a history lesson with where Commonwealth has been. Commonwealth has not historically um, talked about the master person index. Um, if you look back at some of our older materials, we've really just referenced it as an RLS, um, which is not necessarily wrong. Um, but today we really like to talk about these things um, both independently and then how they work together to really provide the best service to our connected members and their clients. 
So the MPI is an index um, that collects patient demographics and then creates um, a person or a human level record with the instances of the patient um, underneath of it. It stores the patient demographic information, both current and historical information, um, so that we can provide the best possible patient match, um, you know, uh, without having a, a national identifier. How does um, the MPI work? So first it relies on some automation. So we have um, an MPI that runs um, in the background. We receive patient um, ads, updates, um, a few different types of sort of uh, patient demographic feeds into the MPI. And then the MPI um, has an algorithm or sort of a, a few algorithms that it runs through to figure out, uh, okay, this, this patient record that's coming in, this patient instance is coming in, do we have any other record of, of this patient? Oh, we do. Okay, so person Liz Buckle already exists within our MPI and we receive um, a new, patient in in instance, and then we're able to associate or link that patient to the other instances of that patient from other care locations. Um, it also is um, simple to some extent. Um, we, over, over the course of the past year to 18 months, we've been working to remove um, manual burden uh, to the best of our abilities. So instead, the MPI sort of is self-functioning and has its own evaluation and weights and scores um, of the various demographic attributes that come in um, so that uh, end users don't have a heavy burden um, to match patients. However, um, we also know that, um, uh, you know, algorithms are never going to be uh, 100 percent and they're not. There's going to be examples and and um, instances where patient demographics are going to be a near match, but not an exact match. And so we also have an MPI that has a reliability factor. So we have sort of an exact matching algorithm that we use, but then we also have a probabilistic um, algorithm that we use. And this does allow for an end user to review and make changes and match patients that fall um, below the exact matching threshold. And so when we think about the MPI, how does it work in tandem with the RLS? So the MPI handles all of the patient matching, um, all of the patient and person instances that exist. And I think on a previous slide I had shared, we have you know over 230 million um, uniquely identified humans within our MPI. But then all of those patient instances also have an associated organization. So if you think of like Liz Buckle as a human, um, I have a patient record at my um, internal medicine clinic. I have a patient record at my OBGYN. I have a patient record at my dermatologist's office and down the line. And so the way that the MPI and RLS work together is the MPI is able to say, oh, these all of these instances of Liz at these various care locations are indeed the same human, the same person. And so through making those associations in the index, we're able to then say, okay, here's the care locations where Liz has been seen. And so you can start to see where these puzzle pieces begin to fit together, um, where then when, you know, an organization wants to make a query for Liz Buckle to the network, we can very easily say, oh, I know all of the care locations where Liz has been seen, and I can go and query all of those on your behalf um, and return the data very uh, seamlessly and efficiently. So why does this matter? Well, over the years, um, you know, these were working assumptions that were made. Uh, we have made some some you know enhancements, but um, it's it's actually pretty uh, cool to see um, that a lot of the original assumptions that were made by the founders of Commonwealth still make sense um, and still seem to be the best way to do things. 
So it matters because, like I said, Commonwealth able, is able to know um, the comprehensive list of patient care locations that are associated with a human, a person. We know how to dedupe and merge patients, um, and we know how to respond to a query with a comprehensive search result. And that means that we don't have to rely on a geographical boundary to find the patient. We don't have to return an incomplete list of patient care locations. If the um, care location is connected to Commonwealth, um, we're able to you know, know that and return um, the document list uh, for that patient when a query is made. And then finally, we don't spam or fish to find um, patients. We don't have to send unnecessary queries to um, an attempt to find patients. And we have a couple more you know, ways to hit this home. Um, but if you think about just at a very low practical level. Um, I live in Wilmington, North Carolina. Let's say for the sake of argument that there are a hundred provider organizations here in Wilmington. Probably there's probably more, but just for the argument. Um, I am seen at three of them. But if you draw a boundary of 50 miles around where I live, um, that means that you're going to query all of those 100 organizations and say, do you have Liz Buckle? Do you have Liz Buckle? Do you have Liz Buckle? But only three out of the 100 are going to respond and say yes. That's not an efficient way to try to find out where I've been and try to get access to my clinical record. Um, that's, you know, 97% of the time, you're not finding me. Um, and, and given the scale of the type of exchange that we see, um, it's not feasible for, you know, systems to be able to bear that load. Um, so this is why we strongly believe that the MPI coupled with the RLS are really, really important services um, that um, are critical to be able to scale uh, clinical data exchange. Um, so again, this sort of just sort of drives home that same point. I'm gonna probably bypass this slide pretty quickly because um, I have another video that will walk through this. But again, we feel very strongly that you know the patient record search leveraging the RLS um, is the best model because it allows for a comprehensive uh, search result. Um, and this is sort of a real life example, um, also plays out in the video I'm gonna share. But the short of it is, what, I'll, what, what you should look for here in the video that I'll share here in a bit. Um, in my example that I provided about myself living in Wilmington, um, I talked about you know a 50 mile radius around where I live. In this real life example, um, for this person living in Hoboken, he traveled 73 miles, so you know, not too far outside of the 50 mile radius, but just far enough where uh, that geofencing search would not return his clinical data um, in a time of need, in a time of emergency. So because of all of these things working together, because of the MPI and the RLS working together, we then are able to have a really strong data broker. So this data broker is um, querying and retrieving um, on our members' behalfs, on the connected providers' behalfs. Um, and so our members are able to uh, send in one XCA or fire query, and then we return a document list um, of all of the documents that we found that are available for that patient. And then our you know, the end users are able to retrieve what they want to retrieve. Um, they can select a subset of those documents. They can retrieve them all, um, you know, oftentimes based on the configuration within their system. Our data broker is also um, able to support both XCA, which is the IHE, Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise Profiles. So the um, XCA query and XCA retrieve functions. And then we're also able to, to support FHIR R4 document reference and binary resources. Um, and then we sort of handle in between um, using um, uh, an MH MHD, um, the ability to 
move between an XDA and FIRE model so that our members can connect um, using their method of choice. Most often today, we are seeing um, members connect in using FIRE R4. All of this, like I said at the beginning of the core services section, um, is you know wrapped inside of a trust network. This happens in a couple of different ways. Obviously, we have a really um, strong security layer, technical security layer. Um, it is the first component that all of our members have to go through when they certify. Um, all of our connected service adopters have to go through a um, stringent certification process um, where they have to go into a test environment and uh, they have test cases that they have to pass um, before they're able to um, move into production. We also don't store any clinical data, um, but we do have a strong security approach, um, you know, in order to make sure that when we're moving the data through the data broker, that it is uh, secure. Um, and then the only trusted systems, uh, you know, are permitted to execute requests against the platform. That's really pointing to our certification process. So we have the certification process, plus we also have um, our, you know, agreements that we have in place with our members that outline their requirements and our requirements um, and the like. <coughs> um, so today, we really have two main types of data exchange that we do over the network. We've been trying to get um, payment and healthcare operations off the ground as well. So those are coming uh, in the near term. We're just taking some time to sort of rework them. Um, but today, primarily, uh, the network is used for treatment or provider to provider exchange. It is what the network was founded on. So if you look through our specification, the bulk of our specification is really, um, you know, was really written as treatment as the foundation. Um, and then we've layered on um, other use cases. So the other primary use case that we support today is patient access. We um, allow consumer applications to um, give patients the ability to query for their own clinical data. We do have some additional requirements um, on top of the, the standard certification requirements. And the key requirement is that those patient access vendors have to have an identity proofing solution that is Kintara certified. Kintara, the Kintara initiative is a um, third party certification body um, that certifies credential service providers and component service providers. Um, so there's sort of like a suite of types of um, um, identity solutions that can be certified, um, but specific to Commonwealth, we do require that our members that offer patient access have to have a contract with a Kintara certified vendor um, and that they have to, that vendor has to be certified on IAL2 and that IAL2 workflow has to be integrated into their solution. All of these things are required for um, the certification process for uh, patient access. And right now we have just shy of 30%, actually didn't rerun the numbers before this, so we may have actually passed over the 30% mark um, of provider organizations that are responding to these types of queries today. We hope to see an increase um, in the number of provider organizations that are responding to patient access, especially as we um, move into a broader uh, TEFCA um, ecosystem. All right, so now let's just quickly watch um, together the RLS and TEFCA video to just share a little bit more about um, how that works. Let me just switch over here. and should be able to see my screen again. Interoperability, the ability of computer systems to exchange and make use of information, is critical to improving healthcare quality and the reason Commonwealth Health Alliance exists. Commonwealth believes that health data should be available to individuals and caregivers regardless of where care occurs. Founded in 2013 and now comprised of robust and growing membership, Commonwealth is a national vendor-neutral trade alliance that has built a nationwide health data exchange network. The healthcare data landscape is evolving. The new trusted exchange framework and common agreement, known as TEFCA, 
is a government-level initiative to connect existing healthcare data hubs and enhance nationwide exchange. Commonwealth has the experience and scale to help TEFCA succeed and further improve nationwide interoperability. Commonwealth has developed a nationwide record locator service, or RLS, which is how patient data is located within the network and shared with providers, patients, and other authorized users. With the RLS, one request is made to the network and the requesting provider receives real-time and comprehensive results. Without an RLS, a system has to make multiple inefficient requests and generally can only search a limited geographic area, say within 50 miles of a patient's home. This means a less efficient search and incomplete results. Take this real-world example. Sam lives in Hoboken, New Jersey. While visiting his father 73 miles south on the Jersey Shore, he suffers an asthma attack that requires an ambulance trip to the emergency department. Sam struggles to speak clearly. ED providers urgently need his data to treat him. Then they need to share his ED data with his pulmonologist in Hoboken to review once Sam is back home. With a limited geo-fenced search, Sam's full records would not be available. These are the moments when interoperability matters most. To access all of Sam's data and improve patient outcomes, a nationwide RLS is the solution. With its RLS, 70 plus members, and a decade-long track record of community building and innovation, Commonwealth is ready for what's next. Here at Commonwealth, we'll continue to build and grow, and we'll work closely with TEFCA to help it succeed. The future of healthcare is interoperability, and the future of interoperability is at Commonwealth today. Join the Alliance. All right, so I promise that's the last uh, video that I will um, have you watch here, but um, it really helps to, I guess, tell this story, um, and I don't think that he will mind, but we actually, uh, the story that we're sharing here is actually um, Paul's story. So this scenario is, you know, we changed the name, um, but this is a real scenario that did take place. And so you can see very quickly that um, while most of your care probably does exist within your quote unquote health home um, or, you know, typically within a certain radius around where you live, that sometimes when you need it most that care is occurring further away um you know we all can probably think about examples in our own lives or with our own family and friends where people have had to seek medical care outside of their health home you know specifically we think about cancer and having to travel to see um you know a specific cancer specialist perhaps in another state and so to be able to collect medical information uh in a timely manner when it matters is is really critical and why we still want to drive um you know the power and the significance of the national rls forward so we've talked about tefka i've thrown the word out tefka i've thrown um the qhin word out a little bit too um but what is that so tefka is um the trusted exchange framework and common agreement um and this is sort of a depiction of um of you know what what the structure is um so tefka comes from the 21st century cures act um which mandates that the onc the office of the national coordinator um defines uh a trusted exchange framework um for clinical data exchange to scale electronic health information um and so the onc um has uh has um selected um, a recognized coordinating entity or RCE, uh, that is the Sequoia Project, which provides oversight um, and governance and guidance uh, for the qualified health information networks um, and those that participate within them. Um, qualified health information networks is um, is a type of health information network that is designated specifically by the RCE and that has signed the common agreement. Um, and so Commonwealth is one of those um, and it, they work together to sort of create this network of networks um, to help, uh, you know, expand nationwide interoperability. 
and really, you know, if you think about sort of the foundation um, of what Commonwealth has done over the past decade, it really lends itself very nicely to what TEFCA is working to accomplish. Um, and so because of that, it was a natural step for us to become a QHEN, and we received that designation earlier this year. Uh, we've been working very closely with our new technical service provider, LK, um, and our members to bring uh, them up on this new platform. Um, but really, you know, it's a combination of our experience, the scale that we've been able to grow to and trust um, that has allowed us to get to this point and really where we felt like, like I said, it's just sort of a natural next step um, that was necessary for us to take. We still have the intra Commonwealth network um, and we still connect as a care quality implementer for as long as that, you know, ex exists and has connectivity um, and has endpoints. Um, and then, you know, as a third uh, solution, we also now are connected um, to TEFCA and the other QHINs. Um, I included this, <coughs> excuse me, I included this um, slide in here because it does have a link to our services demo um, and we'll share this deck out with uh, everyone who registered for Commonwealth 101 after um, after the meeting today. But this is a it's a little bit longer. I think it's about eight minutes long, um, but it really uh, shows the closer look at how different systems work together to receive information. Another good example, um, which I can include as a link, is um, is our HIMSS demonstration from a year or two ago um, that kind of walks through step by step each of the members um, and how their systems interact with each other, all leveraging the Commonwealth network. So we have a number of resources available to our members that I like to point out. Um, a lot of them are available on our website. So we have all of the videos that I've shared today. We have a news center um, with a blog and um, other sorts of materials. Um, we have a Tefka page, and I think actually all of these um, images are linked. Uh, so when you get this deck, um, you can click on any of these images. Um, we have a policies page as well that's really important for members to take a look at that's referenced. It includes our data privacy and security policies. It includes our end user license agreement. It includes Tefka flow down terms um, and much more. So it's definitely something that I want to make sure that um, our members um, and those who are out, you know, in the market who are interested in Commonwealth um, know is, you know, available. Um, we also have uh, on our website um, a number of featured videos. We have a feature uh, that if you go to our main page, it's under uh, heading who is connected and it gives you the ability to search for providers. Um, you can also download our entire directory to a CSV or spreadsheet, um, which, you know, in my opinion, makes it easier to uh, search and, you know, filter and, and mess around with. Um, but we have it both in the UI and the downloadable version. And then we engage, um, you know, within the broader health IT space, um, uh, you know, on X, which I'll probably always call Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram and LinkedIn. We probably, um, you know, are most visible on LinkedIn, um, but we do, uh, you know, encourage members um, and others within the space to connect with us there and see the latest and greatest of what we're up to. Um, we also post a lot about where we'll be when we have speaking engagements, when we're going to vendor shows, when we're going to um, hymns and vibe and health and all of those good things. Um, we also have our specification, which we just uh, published our latest version back in June um, on our website. So our specification is public. It's something that's available, you know, more broadly to the market and it has two parts. So part one is the services 
uh, portion. Um, this is really the, the technical part of the specification. This is what you know your engineers would use um, to help guide through the the you know integration process. And then we also have our use cases, our part two of the specification. This is really talking about um, the what, you know, the what what can you do? What are the parameters and requirements? It has a little bit more of a policy like tone um, to it, and um, it explains sort of, what you can do uh, in order to interact with the network. And then within Commonwealth, um, our members, we encourage them to get involved and participate within Commonwealth committees. Um, we actually used to have nine committees. We just recently streamlined them down pretty significantly. Um, we felt that it was uh, sort of a, a larger burden for members to sort of allocate resources across multiple different committees. And so now we really have three core committees um, that we would encourage our members to get involved with and participate in. We really strongly advise that if you're a service adopter member and you're either going through the integration process or you're already live in production, that you have um, you know at least one representative in all three of these committees. It's really critical to stay up to date um, with both where we are, proposed changes that are being made, um, enhancements to technology, and you know changes to policy that um, are being proposed. And then we also have an internal resource um, that's our Commonwealth SharePoint. It is only available to members. Um, it includes subsites that have information about our legacy platform and our new platform. Um, we provide committee information, documentation storage. We have a marketing toolkit. You can see here um, in the image, we have um, specific pages that talk about um, you know, our discrete fire exchange implementation guide, which is something that's not, you know, live in production yet, but has been tested and we're still, you know, excited about it. Um, and we, we just share really anything, anything and everything related to the Alliance lives here in our internal SharePoint site. So for those of you who are already a member, um, welcome. We are so glad you're here. Um, let us know what you need. Let us know if you need help with anything. Um, if you're a service adopter, you should already be connected in with the right people um, to be testing and, and getting your solution off the ground. Um, but if you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. As I had mentioned at the very top of this presentation, we're a small team. You can really um, reach out to any of us and we'll get you to where you need to go. But we do point people to the EA, which stands for Executive Admin, EA at CommonwealthAlliance.org. Uh, Marina oversees that account and she'll make sure that you get to where you need to go. Um, if you're joining us and you want to become a member, I would ask that you go to our website and complete our contact us form. Um, this just helps us to sort of collect key information and, and you know, make sure that we don't lose things. Um, or you can email us directly at membership at commonwealthalliance.org. And I oversee that one. Um, so you'll come directly to me uh, if you need any help there. And then one last thing. Um, we are ho really, really, really excited to um, be hosting our annual fall summit in Nashville this year at the Renaissance in Nashville Hotel, November 4th and 5th. Um, this is the first year we are opening up this conference to non-members. So historically, it's only been Commonwealth members, and now it'll be Commonwealth members and others within the space who are interested in participating, maybe prospective members, maybe clients of members um, who want to come and join us and uh, be a part of the conversation. It's very close to the airport. We have a really excellent room rate, and that is not uh, marketing fluff that is real. We actually, um, in one of our staff meetings, we were looking up room rates for adjacent hotels and they were significantly more expensive than what we got in our block. So we do want to encourage anybody who is interested in attending to please make sure that you book your hotel room through our block, which is accessible through our website, um, because otherwise you may not get the best rate. 
We also have a registration open now. Our early bird discount does end on July 31st, which is coming up very soon. So please do take advantage of that. Um, I have the link here. And then um, the, the information is also in the chat. Thank you so much uh, to, I think Marina put that in there. Please check it out. Um, it's going to be a fabulous time. We always get really positive feedback about our fall summit. And of course, this year we're looking to make it bigger and better uh, than ever. We'll have Mickey Tripathi as one of our keynote speakers. We do expect to announce a second keynote speaker here soon. We have a lot of different topics that we're gonna be um, bringing in subject matter experts to talk about, including obviously Tefka, but um, also cybersecurity, data usability, um, the state of Commonwealth, where we're going, our product roadmap, and much, much more. And then I know we're at time, um, but we do have sponsorship opportunities available that I you know, have to obviously share. If you'd like to have your name and your logo associated with our event, please do reach out um, and we would be happy to work with you um, to find the right way to sponsor our event. And with that, I just want to say thank you. Um, I know I didn't leave a ton of time for, for questions. Um, this was recorded. And so we'll be sharing that information out with you guys. If you have any questions following the session, my email is here. It's very simple. It's just liz at commonwealthalliance.org. Please do feel free to um, reach out. And I see a question, how often is this 101 scheduled? We like to try to do it quarterly. Um, it does vary a little bit. Uh, if we get a big influx of new members, we'll hold it a little bit more frequently or a little bit less frequently, um, but we do try to hold it quarterly. And then we always make available the slides and the recording from the previous session for those who might be interested. So with that, I think we will close it out for today. I appreciate all of you for attending. Um, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you so much.